who knew all the booty that would just be accomplished <laughs> since the 90s? <laughs> And who knew creating the term booty call could springboard a career, and not just any career, one with purpose. Once I got that opportunity, I knew I had to represent. Everything had to be indicative that brothers like us can be sh smart, funny, and actually execute. And he's been executing since the 90s. But how did 30 years of acting, hosting, and comedy get started? Bill Bellamy, today on The Pulse. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, man. I mean, and show up and show out. I love doing this show because I get to talk to people who I've watched, who I've admired, who I've seen the different things they're doing, their performances. And today, comedian, actor, I was reading his bio, it said trailblazer of MTV in the 90s and inventor of booty call. <laughs> Listen, that was my favorite part of the bio. The inventor of booty call, Bill Bellamy. How are you, sir? I'm all the way turned up. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to tell you, one of our producers from outside of the country helps book, book the show as an awesome perspective. And she was saying to me as she was doing research, I didn't realize he created the word booty call. And I said, see, I you didn't come up in the <laughs> States in the 90s because anybody who did, we all know. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're all familiar with the creation of the is, term, right. <laughs> right? Jokes are like songs, you know, and some songs are timeless. Like this joke is timeless. Like, you know, Eddie Murphy's joke, Goonie Goo Goo. You know, it's just certain things in the uh, pop culture that sticks. Booty call is just one of those things that was so funny to people. They just start saying this it. like a famous quote from a movie, you know what I mean? And uh, who knew all the booty that would just be accomplished <laughs> since the 90s? <laughs> and that's why the rest of us know. And exactly. thank you for the call. You made a Absolutely. practice common behavior and acceptable behavior. Yeah, it, made, it made it funny without it being nasty, you know what I mean? That's why, you know, in the early 90s, you had to be creative how you could say something that you could say on television. So that was that was my way of talking about getting that booty, but you got to make the booty call. Like, it literally, and bam, as soon as I said it, everybody starts saying it, because it's right. true. That's this generation's text message. Like, you up? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where that is now. See, they swipe it to the left, to the right. We was really calling. <laughs> <laughs> that That almost didn't happen. Because that the whole joke and that whole thing, that night when you were performing, they they tried to pull you off stage. Wow, that that one move would have kind of changed the trajectory of my career because the joke that I was going to do, which was booty call, was brand new, and that night they were trying to bump me off the show um, because uh, Charlie Barnett was on stage and he was literally killing, and it was like we're going to let him close the show because you know this guy he just totally did such a great job. And I was backstage waiting to go on. I was like, dog, I don't care. Like, just just let me do my thing, man. I got something, I got something. And he was like, nah, B, it don't make sense. And I was like, dog, look, I came all the way from Jersey, bro, on everything, bro. My car probably gone, I double parked. I got, I got to do this joke. And he, you know, uh, shout out to Andre Brown, you know, he let me go on stage anyway. And uh, HBO was in the building and the rest is history. So that night, Russell Simmons was in the building. So that actually kind of launched the Deaf Comedy Jam, at least for you. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it launched uh, a lot of people's careers because that was sort of like the scouting night of what this culture and hip hop was doing, uh, what comedy was doing in New York. And Russell Simmons was pioneering this movement at this time. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, man. I mean, and show up and show out. Any of us who came up around that era, we remember MTV, we remember the shows. Like MTV was a cultural phenomenon then. MTV was the place for cool, for pop culture and what was next. It was a one-stop shop. You couldn't go nowhere else to get all that in one place. It was like a news station, a radio station, and a place to watch videos. <laughs> the MTV thing was comedy, interviews, a little bit of acting, because y'all did skits. Like, it seemed like that yeah. may have been kind of the foundation for, you know, the next 20, what, 30 years now. It was definitely a springboard for me because I got a chance to do all the things that my talent 
was capable of. You know, I can act, I can be funny, I can host a show. Uh, I was able to practice my interviews. Uh, I got a chance to interview everybody from Michael Jackson to Janet to Kurt Cobain to Tupac, Biggie, uh, Jay-Z, Destiny's Child. Like, I just want to take people back a little bit because I don't want that era to get lost. You know, I don't want to hear about the 90s, 30 years from now. Like, I want people to really understand how prolific the 90s pop culture explosion really was. I mean, like, we were wearing, remember, I don't know how old you were in 92, 93, but we were wearing bright, bright colors. <laughs> remember, we was wearing, like, cross colors. Yeah, man. Boo -boo. Yeah. We had TLC. We had uh, Leaders of the New School. I mean, it was so much fun. Busta Rhymes, Missy Elliott. It was crazy. Didn't Coca-Cola have, like, a brand? And we were rocking the Coca-Cola shirts. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It was exactly everything it was man. really a fun time man i mean it's definitely definitely worth going back and, and really being nostalgic yeah and that gonna make me pull out pictures or whatnot wearing my x hat and the overalls with the one strap over the corner. what why do we have the one strap off i do not I know. know i do not know we were just know. trying to be cool i mean i, I blame no you idea. like you were setting you trends were, at that point so i was setting trends yeah, yeah. i was wearing the oversized clothes right. i was wearing like i was wearing like 100 145 pounds but i had 75 pounds of fabric on it was great i don't know if i could come out tonight yo come on how long could it take you to get over here bro? Five minutes, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Just let me throw something on, okay? I'm coming, all right? Don't play. You coming? Top villain, your book, your story, not out yet, April of, of next year. But it digs into a lot of those cultural phenomenons and things that were happening. But it also, like, you were, you were on track to go have that, that good corporate job before you just stepped away from it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, I got out of college from Rutgers, and I just wanted to get a really good job. I got a great job, and um, and I worked there for like two years. And um, during that course of that time, you know, I was really, really being progressive. I was probably one of very few African American um, college grads at this position out of school. So I was really like one of maybe five guys that came in on a, on a uh, managerial level um, and, and was on a program to progress. Like, so they were really being diverse and trying to like get young, smart people to come into the company at the time. So I really didn't have a, a bad situation. It was just like, I wanted a greater life. <laughs> I just didn't want to do the corporate thing. It just felt like there was so many ceilings in corporate America as far as creatively and so I was nervous to make a step like this. I'll be honest with you. I was just very, very nervous to give up a bird in the hand for, for unlimited possibilities at that time. You then were opening doors at MTV and comedy. Did you, did you realize the impact? Did you realize that you were actually opening doors and not just making people laugh and be entertained? Um, yes, I did know that because there was nobody that would look like me on MTV, you know, um, uh, the, as I was coming in, Ed Lover and Dr. Dre were leaving. So your MTV uh, was coming to a kind of to a close for whatever reason, didn't know why. And so then, uh, MTV jams and, uh, top 20 countdown, like all this pop culture stuff just exploded. And, you know, uh, our music was able to catch that wave, you know? They were starting to play TLC and Tevin Campbell and um, SWB. You have Nas and Boyz II Men. Like, it was, it, was, it was so eclectic, the kind of artists that we were doing. Diggable Planets, cats yeah. don't even know about this stuff. Huh. And we're going back to Tribe Called Quest, you know, that, that was that first album, you know? And I was there going, oh my God, man, this is so cool that these artists are blowing up it was a it was a beautiful situation. I remember yes. Diggable Planets performed on the quad at George Washington University, just no out there in the middle. And I feel like part of that we just walking through campus, and you come over to the quad. It was like a homecoming kind of thing, and they performed there. And you guys Absolutely. made that type of thing cool. They're performing at beach houses. They're performing and interacting with people. Like they became accessible because of a lot of what you guys were doing. And it was purposeful, you know. Um, I didn't know I would become 
you know, this sort of like Casey Kasem slash Dick Clark of, of, of hip hop or whatever. But it, it was really the timing of my life being in the right place at the right time and getting a chance to, to really be the, the ambassador. And, and I knew I wanted cats that looked like me to win. How do you transition that? Because then you kind of did the comedy, you did the hosting, you started taking on some of the, I mean, always funny and entertaining, but some of the more serious and impactful roles. You're, you're, you're in a Madam C.J. Walker movie. How do you yeah. kind of transition to those types of things? Well, it's a process, you know, because sometimes people don't know you can do other things and you have to get the chance or the opportunity to do that and then be ready for the opportunity, right? So I always wanted to be an actor because I was interviewing actors every day and I was like, damn, I want somebody to interview me. Yeah. Like these guys are <laughs> dropping movies every week. You know, I'm interviewing Will Smith for Independence Day, Salma Hayek, Halle Berry, uh, um, uh, Keanu Reeves and Tom Cruise. I'm interviewing these cats. They pushing these big studio movies. I was like, dog, I got to get in one of these damn movies. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and just the, just the ambition of it all. And I didn't know, you know, how to do it. I didn't have a plan. I just knew I wanted to. So just once I painted that picture in my head, I guess just my, my ambition, foolish ambition drove me to get to that destination. You know, when the doors opened for you, you seem to take very seriously what you're presenting, particularly as black men in these different fields. It's important that images that we put on screen, I think it's important in what we do and what we say. And so I've always, you know, just been that kind of cat that wanted to represent from not only cats that look like me, but people that came from my kind of background, you know, where I had a tough upbringing. Um, you know, we weren't, uh, you know, uh, it was a blue collar family, you know, work hard kind of family, like would stay in a company for 30 years yeah. and get a pension. You know, my parents was those type of fat. Uh, mom and dad and so I was just like I want to break out of this and just like break the mold and do something that's never been done before and so once I got that opportunity I knew I had to represent everything everything had to represent to me like everything had to be indicative of that it's possible everything had to be indicative that you know uh, brothers like us can be sh smart funny um uh ambitious and 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 actually execute you know what I mean we can do everything if we put our mind to it next on the pulse now as a rule bill bellamy doesn't talk politics but in this case only mm. politics i want to talk about is herschel walker that's it <laughs> uh, every time i see herschel walker i go a mind is a terrible thing to wait but that whale at SeaWorld had killed nine of the trainers, okay? He is obviously a thug whale, okay? <laughs> okay, he don't want to be at SeaWorld. He's swimming around. <laughs> I wish somebody would get in this <laughs> water. All right, so we've talked about kind of some of the background, how we got here, but what here is, at least now, <laughs> coming to Philadelphia, at the Leah Chorus Center, doing the We Outside comedy tour with a yeah. whole bunch of people. So tell me what's going on. This tour is is really, really a combination of vets from different places and some of the new people, right? So you got me, you got Kid Capri with the music. So, you know, we kind of like that old school hip hop kind of situation. And then you got Tony Rock, he's coming through. You got, uh, uh, who else we got? Um, uh, Michael Blackson, um, uh, Kelly Kells, almost like a, like the Avengers. You know, everybody's got a little superhero powers. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Is comedy still fun? It feels like that we had oh, yeah. a couple comedians oh, yeah. on. People take things really seriously these days. You know, somebody's throwing bottles at people on stage because no, of things that, that they say. That, people yeah, that's, fight. that's that's because every now and then it's just people just get in their feelings. But at the same time, what would we do without comedy? Comedy is the relief for the culture. It's a relief for people that want to come out, have a few cocktails, and just go, oh, my God, yes. Woo! Because when you laugh really, really hard, you feel good. It releases crazy endorphins it just makes you feel good it releases tension from you you walk out smiling feeling better than you did walking in so comedy ain't going nowhere we're here to we're here to do what we've been gifted to do philly is 
been known traditionally for comedy my whole career. I've never had a show in Philly that wasn't to the wall. Because Philly, y'all just like that. I mean, Philly, <laughs> if they love you, they love you to the end. If they hate you, they hate you. That's it. They don't have no in-between. Seeing the way y'all was born, Ben, ben Simmons, they had yeah, t-shirts, Mr. Softy. I was like, dang, come they went and got t-shirts. Listen, I, I try to be the nice, respectful guy. Ben Simmons earned <laughs> what Philadelphia is giving him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he learned all that. I'm, I'm not going to talk about challenges people have, the personal stuff or whatever. But in terms of, I mean, this dude out there pumping his chest out when he hits a free throw. Like you want to shush the crowd after you hit a free throw and then you miss the next three? <laughs> see, see that Philly coming out of you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Years ago when I, I read an interview you did that you said there were a couple things you wouldn't talk about. One of them was you don't want to do politics. Since yeah. then, the world kind of changed. <laughs> there was yeah. a lot of... of the only, say, t- only politics I want to talk about is Herschel Walker. That's it. <laughs> uh, every time I see Herschel Walker, I go, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. I don't understand how he could say, I got to get ready for this erection. Oh, and nobody <laughs> said nothing. Nobody... <laughs> You ever, you ever just say, oh, my God, like, oh, my God, and you go, oh, my God, no, he's not about to Oh, my yeah, God. He, he made it. me say, oh, my God, like 82 times every time they, they interview him. See, now you're about to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. And you know, you got to tip to Just listen, let me talk. I can, I can be right. canceled. Like, you on tour, you're doing your own thing. I can still be canceled. But it got yeah, so bad was- that you were sitting back going, like, I don't, I don't even know if I'm supposed to laugh at this because he, he's serious. I know, because I swear to you, when you watch Herschel Walker, don't it seem like you're watching an SNL skit? I was like, nah, that's an that's a actor. No, mm-hmm. that's really Herschel. <laughs> oh, my God. This is oh when I expect, I expect scrolling across the screen, the opinions expressed by the guests and hosts <laughs> on this program are not necessarily in line with the ownership and management. Uh, tell us about the book, because uh, we started touching on it just a little bit, uh, but Top Billing um, coming out soon. Hard copy and the audio book will be out um, in April of 2023. It's called Top Billing. Um, same name as my podcast, uh, and it's, it's basically stories of laughter, love and triumph, um, my career, my life, things that, you know, um, I went through things that I had to overcome things that was just like, oh my God, moments that I never told anybody. So I got an opportunity to do this in, in the narration, which is really cool. And then when you hear me do it on the audio book, I think it's just going to transform you into the nineties. You know, we ain't taking no vaccine because we got our own vaccine. It's called VIX. We end every episode of the pulse with the concept of use your voice for good. Two things I want to ask you. One, I want to ask you what that means to you, but I also have been reading this, uh, this comedy collective and, and one of the trailblazers Sinbad, Um, has not been doing very well. And you've kind of spoken out about the need for people to be supportive of him and and kind of don't forget him. Well, Sinbad is a perfect example who is a big brother to me in respect to, he was one of the first guys to ever put me on TV, right? And so um, to me, I said, with all these popular, very successful comedians, we should protect him. Like we should make sure he is okay and his family is good. Like, let's not let him just be like some comedian that was, you know, uh, we liked and stuff like, yo, he's in a fraternity. He has definitely put in his, his time and he is a, a, a OG in a game. And he has like, what you say seniority, there's no way that we can sit back and watch, you know, one of our fellow comedians that pioneered and was a trailblazer for us, just not get help. I don't care if it's bringing food to the house, if it's, you know, financial or, 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 or just constantly keeping his name buzzing so we don't forget about him. All of these things can help. Prayer, prayer is powerful, right? And a lot of times when people get sick, you forget, people forget about you because they don't see you. And now you get depressed and you feel like your value and your imprint is in there. And I, I don't want that to happen to Sinbad. He's a great guy. Bill Bellamy, we appreciate you taking time with us. We appreciate what you've done. We're going to sell out the Leah Chorus Center so everybody yes. can come get, <laughs> get a taste of the, the We Outside tour, and we'll, get, we'll yes. get that book on the bestseller list. We appreciate you. Holla. Bro.
Love you, man. Way to go, Bill. Wait, hey, man. Way to keep it clean, Billy. Yeah. <laughs> Now we're going to end this interview, and I'm going to go over the right, loudspeaker. Uh, Bill, we didn't need to talk to you about that Herschel Walker segment. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I love this, and I hope you do as well. Talking to people who have influenced our lives, who have done fun things, who are impactful, who we grew up with, and Bill Bellamy falls into all of those categories. And there is more. If you want the extended version, check out the podcast. It's available all places where you get your podcast. Just subscribe and download. You'll get a notification whenever we've got a new show every Monday. And make sure you join us next time on The Pulse for comedian, actor from Jackass fame, Steve-O. I appreciate you. I thank you. And I leave you as I always do with a reminder that whenever you can, use your voice for good and have a good one.